Martin Green Studio with co-host John Gilstrap, New York Times best-selling author. Uh, Matt Harvey uh, was going to co-host today, and then something came up work-related later on in the evening yesterday, and he said, I can't make it, sorry. And he said, I will really miss Randall Reed Smith, who's scheduled to be on the program today at 9.30. Have you met Randall Reed Smith? I don't think I have. I'm, I'm told he'll be in studio. We'll, we'll see. What happens when you get people with real jobs? Yeah. They get conflicts and stuff. Yeah, uh, you used to have a real How long has it been since you had a real job? Uh, t- uh, 10 years. Yeah, 10 years. 10? 10. I thought it was longer than that. Yeah. Well, I, I went, actually went back. I was a full-time writer, and I got bored with that. So I went back and had a, another big boy job while I was still writing, and then I quit that one. What did you do? Uh, I went back to the trade association oh. for the scrap industry. Our guest in this segment has probably done taxes for some trade industries. CPA Ken Apple. Good morning, Kenneth. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, John. Good morning. The funniest man in accounting, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. Did you prepare your stand-up act for today, Ken? Yeah, I was sorry to hear that, that Matt wasn't going to miss me. Yes, he didn't mention you by name specifically, but he did mention Randall Reed Smith. Yeah, so the last time uh, you asked me to be on, I was on a cruise, and uh, I don't I don't read for pleasure because I have to read so much for my job. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my wife is an avid reader, and so I got bored sitting by the pool, and she said, "Well, why don't you read this book?" And it was a John Gilstrap novel, Hellfire, ah. which, which was uh, which a very good book. Oh, thank you. Also read Benjamin Hall's uh, book, uh, Save, which was very good also. I well, appreciate so, that. I read two books last year. That's uh, not bad. It's a good start. Where do you rank Hellfire in your list of books, John, in your, in your top 10 or 20 or 30? Really, really good. <laughs> I, don't, I can't do that. You don't, you, I don't, you, I don't, you don't have a book that's your personal preference? No. Not even Nathan's Run, though, the book that yeah, made Well, I mean, that's, that's the one that changed my life. Yeah. So, you know, that, that ranks right up there. But no, I think they're all really good. I have, a, I have a least favorite, but I won't say what that one is. That was a long time ago. Should have never asked but, the question. Yeah. Ken, when is tax deadline day this year? Tax deadline day is Monday, the 15th this year. So it's actually going to be on the 15th. It's actually going to be on the 15th this year unless you live in Massachusetts or Maine. They have some kind of a state holiday in those two states, but, if, but only if you live in those states do you get to wait until Tuesday. Okay, so by the 15th, you have to have, you can get an extension, but it doesn't forgive you from having to pay what you might owe. That's right. You can get an automatic extension of time to file your return, but you cannot get an extension of time to pay your taxes that are due. So you have to calculate or estimate if you're going to owe anything on April 15th, and if so, pay it, and then you can extend for six months the time to actually file the tax return. What are your options if you can't afford to pay the taxes? Uh, you can borrow it. Uh, I would, I would recommend borrowing it from a bank or a credit card before you would borrow it from the IRS. But uh, if you borrow it from the IRS, you're just going to file an extension and say, "I don't have a balance due." And then when you file, you will have a balance due, and they'll charge you penalties and interest on that balance back to April fifteenth when you should have paid it. Isn't the process of filling out the tax forms the way one figures out how much one owes or not? Exactly. Excellent observation. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's just a, a wild guess, and you hope that you're within the sleeve of being able to afford the penalties, right? Okay. So, I mean, most people that are going to owe a significant amount of money are people who make estimated tax payments during the year anyway. So they're going to have a first quarter estimate on 2024 due on Monday also. So what I tend to do when people need an extension is I just add to that so that the extension payment covers what I think might be due plus the first quarter estimate. Uh, so if I'm even if I'm way off, the extension payment will at least cover last year, and I'll only be late on an estimate for this year. If you're self-employed, Ken, and this actually has come up recently from a friend of mine, if you're self-employed and you haven't been paying your Social Security taxes all year long, is that uh, the exact same uh, method in terms of having to pay things on time and extensions and such? Yes. So when you pay your taxes to the federal government, you pay both your federal income tax and your self-employment tax all in one payment. So you would have an attachment to your tax return that's your self-employment tax calculation, and it would get added to your federal income tax. 
and that entire balance is, is your federal tax. So both your self-employment tax and your federal income tax should be paid in quarterly as you go. Now, this, uh, this person went to H&R Block, and they did not tell them that their Social Security should have been part of what they're paying with their federal, and at the end of the year, they just found out from somebody else that they now owe over $5,000. I said, you should have gone to Ken Apple. Thank you. You're welcome. So you, you may get some business. <laughs> You'll know because it'll be the person that says, I owe $5,000 on security. Uh, Ken, let's talk about the uh, inflation creep is how you've described it here on uh, your, the tax prep form you uh, put for us here uh, in regards to the, uh, the way the limits have moved up this year as they adjusted for inflation. What are the changes? Yeah, so, so what I'm talking about here is the taxability of your Social Security benefits. Uh, so a little history, prior to 1986, Social Security benefits were not taxable for federal or state purposes anywhere in the country. Uh, there wasn't even a place on the tax return to put them. Uh, some of us would argue that's because I already paid taxes on it when, I, when they took it out of my paycheck, and now mm -hmm. they're just paying it back to me. I would be one of those people. In 1986, they changed the federal tax law to begin collecting federal income taxes on Social Security benefits, but only if you were rich. Okay, So they had a definition of what they determined to be rich in 1986. Problem is they did not adjust that number for inflation. So what they can, the amount of income that you would have that, that would be considered rich in 1986 is the same in 2024. And what is that amount? Do you know it? Uh, it depends on your filing status and several other things. They all, the answer always is it depends. All, always, yeah. yes. Uh, so what happens now is virtually everyone is paying tax on at least some portion of their Social Security benefits. And that was never the intent of the law. The intent of the law was just to charge federal income tax on high income individuals who were collecting social security benefits. So what are those what are those brackets now? What are the, do you have the, the numbers in front of you or are these the ones that I'm having in front of me right now? Okay. So or what was rich in 1986? All right. So in 1986 if you were single, uh, you were they considered you to be rich if you took half of your social security benefits, added it to all of your other income, and the result was more than $25,000. That was rich in 1986. Okay, so if in 1986 you were drawn, let's say you were drawn $10,000 in Social Security benefits in 1986. So you take half of that is five. If you had more than $20,000 of other income, pensions, withdrawals from IRAs, investment income, whatever, then you were considered rich. And, and that may have been true then. Uh, that's still the same calculation in 2024. Does that count Social Security disability income for younger disability people? It does indeed, okay. yes. Uh, so if you have one spouse who is working and making decent money and the other spouse is on Social Security disability, yeah, 85% of that Social Security disability is going to be taxed. Uh, now, I heard Larry, Larry talking earlier about the prices of houses and the interest rates in 1986. Uh, so if you think about what a house cost in 1986 and what a house cost today, or what a, a new car cost in 1986, what a new car cost today, uh, certainly those income limitations should have changed, but they haven't. So I have a poster child client of mine for this problem, uh, and it's a, re it's a widow, an elderly widow, whose only source of income is a pension that has a COLA attached to it and her Social Security benefits. So... Last year, in 2023, she got $20,000 in a pension and $14,000 in Social Security. That's $2,850 a month. That's her total income, $2,850 a month. That's what she has to live on. She has no investment income, no retirement accounts, anything like that. Uh, so I don't care what your political leaning is. You can be the most conservative Republican. You can be the most liberal Democrat. You can be anything in the middle. I don't think anybody is going to argue that this lady should not be paying any federal income tax. Mm -hmm. But she is. Because she is considered rich under 1986 standards. And she has to file a tax return and she has to pay federal income taxes on part of her Social Security benefits. 
and she's bringing in $2,850 a month. It's ridiculous. So the federal law needs to be changed. There, there still exist 12 states in the United States, only 12, that tax some portion of your Social Security benefits. West Virginia is one of those. Uh, they're phasing it out. Eventually, we won't be taxing Social Security. Is that over three years? Uh, it's over the next three, yes. Uh, they already don't tax it. And, and again, they, they set an arbitrary income number when they passed that law four years ago uh, that said for for a single person, if your federal adjusted gross income is under 50000 including your taxable Social Security benefits, then we won't tax your Social Security benefits. But if it's over that, oh, we're currently taxing it. Do uh, they count in the calculation of income? Is that investment income as well? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. And and you can't get out of the calculation by investing in tax-free obligations. So it, it includes non-taxable interest, for example, also. So, I mean, it's a federal issue as far as I'm concerned, so you need to, to talk to your senator and your representative about getting this thing changed, getting it indexed for inflation. I'm not sure there's an appetite for it because that's part of how they're balancing the Social Security deficit. So if they're going to pay me my Social Security benefits but then tax my Social Security benefits... It's the same federal government that's paying me the benefits, that's taxing my benefits. So mm -hmm. I think they've just reduced my Social Security benefits without having to be accused of reducing my Social Security benefits. I agree. If, if any Social Security is taxed, it should only be above what you've contributed. Yeah, so when they, when they introduced the idea in 1986, it actually did make some logical sense because... They put a maximum on it that they could not tax more than 50% of your Social Security benefits. So I could argue that only 50% of my Social Security benefits is my money coming back mm -hmm. because the whole time I worked, my employer matched my Social Security benefit. So half of my Social Security benefits my own money and half of it is my employer's money. So, so there is at least some logic in taxing half of my Social Security benefits. But then they came along and said, we're going to tax up to 85% of it. So logic went out the window there. Mm -hmm. I think what they, would, what they would like to do is not pay you your Social Security benefits, means test it, and say, okay, you've done, you've done a great job of preparing for your own retirement. You don't need Social Security benefits, so we're not going to pay them to you. But that would be so unpopular that they'd never get elected again. <laughs> so the way they get around it is to tax it. And though, even though everybody knows that they're taxing people that shouldn't be paying the taxes on it, they're not going to change it because that's the way they're balancing the Social Security Fund. The West Virginia phase-out, does 24 count as the year for the phase-out, or does it start in 25, 26, 27? Yeah, so 24 will be the first year of the phase-out. Uh, that, that first year will affect almost no one. Why? Okay, so the reason is that <clears throat> The, f the first year phase out is 35% of what your federal taxable Social Security benefits were is what West Virginia is not going to tax. But to the extent that you take advantage of that, you lose your over 65 exemption dollar for dollar. The over 65 exemption is the thing that you bring up each year that many people don't know to take? Yes. So that's an $8,000 exclusion for anyone over the age of 65 in the state of West Virginia. So if I have, let's say I have $10,000 worth of taxable Social Security benefits on my federal return, in 2024, 35% of that I won't have to pay tax on. Right? That's $3,500. But my $8,000 senior citizen's deduction is now reduced to $4,500. So I'm back to 8000 where I started, and this phase-in didn't save me one dime. So you have to, you're going to have to, in, in that person's case, almost wait to the third year to get the savings? Yes, exactly. All right. Ken Apple, our guest here on the program. Uh, tax date line uh, day is the 15th uh, this year. It actually falls in the day when most of us assume it does this year. Uh, there are uh, a couple of other things I wanted to bring uh, up to your attention here, Ken, in regards to 
your federal taxes, the um, deduction that you get, that is inflation adjusted, however. And while they, they may not have done it for Social Security, it, it does adjust for inflation for the federal. What are the differences this year? Yes, so you, I assume you're talking about the standard deduction. Standard deduction. Yes, the standard deduction goes up each year for inflation. Uh, there's a different standard deduction for a single person, a single person over 65, a married couple, and a married couple with one over age 65, and a married couple with both over age 65. Um, the the deduction for a married couple is somewhere around 27. If they're both over 65, it's around 31,000. And the income brackets, were those adjusted for inflation They're as well? They're adjusted every year for inflation, yes. Right. So, uh, and there are how many different tax brackets since the Trump tax cuts? Uh, I think there's seven. Seven, I think is right. Right. So, uh, there's, if I remember, there's a pretty big, uh, like a middle class bracket that's some, about a couple hundred thousand dollars in, in, in gap there. Do you know what yes. I'm talking about? Yes, I do. Yeah. So, the standard deduction... Uh, so let's just call it thirty thousand dollars for talking purposes. The first thirty thousand dollars that a married couple would make doesn't get taxed at all because it gets eliminated by your standard deduction. All right. The next ten thousand or so gets taxed at ten percent, and then anything over that, f up until a, a large number, which I don't have on top of my head, gets taxed at twelve percent. But once you exceed that number, the next tax bracket up jumps from 12% to 22%. Now, you only pay the 22% on the excess that you go over. Uh, so your, our tax planning strategy for most people is to use up the 12% tax bracket but not get into the 22% tax bracket. So if you have income that you can time, if you have traditional IRAs, simple IRAs, that kind of thing, where you can take the money out you might have a required minimum distribution, but you can take more than that out. To the extent that I can get money out of there at 12%, I want to do it because I don't want to arrive at a point in the future where they're making me take money out of there and, and it's being taxed at 22. Can I can to what age can somebody contribute to a SEP plan or an IRA or something like that and and avoid that and, and avoid that as income? Where does that do it? I'm not sure what you're asking, but uh, well, if if you divert income into let's go basic, does income put into a SEP plan count take take it off the qualification for the higher income bracket? I'm, I'm not forming the question well. Okay, so are you talking about taking a tax deduction for contributing money to yes. a retirement account? Yes. Uh, yes, that would lower your income this year, mm -hmm. and and might be a good strategy if it'll bring you out of the 22 percent tax bracket back down into the 12. may not be a good strategy because you're building up a deferred tax asset that one of these days probably for most people when they're age 73 they're going to make make them start taking it out and pay tax on it whether they want to or not but the required distribution can be at a trickle as opposed to it wouldn't necessarily tip over into the higher tax bracket, right? It could trip, trickle out at the lower tax bracket. That's possible, except for this bracket creep on Social Security benefits. So now I'm 73. Both of us are obviously taking our Social Security benefits, and now they're making me take money out of my taxable traditional IRAs, SEPs, simple IRAs, whatever I have. And every time I have to take money out, I not only have to pay tax on that, I have to pay tax on more of my Social Security benefits because my income went up. And at 73, what is the minimum required distribution? It's based on your life expectancy. So whatever the life expectancy tables say for a 73-year-old, which right now is probably about 20 years. Okay, so if it's 20 years, is it 1 20th of the value? Exactly. Okay. So you take out one twentieth each year for the next twenty years, and that's how you get it all out in your lifetime. And you're ballparking right now, Ken. And uh, people listening to this shouldn't take that as the actual distribution percentage, or you absolutely you because there there are different charts based on who the beneficiary is. So your life expectancy tables are different depending on how old your spouse is, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go, uh, a couple other questions in regards to these sorts of things. John's talking about. The timing for 
uh, taking distributions, uh, timing for selling uh, assets, stocks, whatever, in regards to how this affects how you qualify for Medicare and what premium that you pay. Talk about that math for a little bit. Yeah, okay. So, you know, when you turn 65, they, they, change the, they change the age of normal retirement for Social Security benefits from 65 to 67. Uh, so just about everybody now who is who has not attained the age of 67, their normal retirement age is now 67, uh, not 65. But they did not change your eligibility for Medicare. It's still on your 65th birthday. And the premium that you pay for Medicare, which most people have taken out of their Social Security benefits, uh, this year for most people it's $175 a month. But if you're if you are a high income individual, that premium can go up based upon your income. Uh, so for 2024, the year that we're in now, uh, it's based on your 2022 income. If you if a joint couple's 2022 income was over 206,000, then they don't pay $175 a month for their Medicare premium. They pay something higher, and there's a sliding scale uh, that takes it up as high as $500 a month. So if you're a very high income individual, instead of paying $175 a month in Medicare premium, you're paying $500 a month. And both spouses would be paying $500 a month. So there's some planning involved there, too. If you're, if you're close to that number, there's some things that we can do to keep you below the number that's going to make you pay a higher Medicare premium. But you should talk to Ken uh, before you make any decisions on what to do about these situations. Absolutely. Uh, and what can people do right now to reduce their tax liability for the 23 tax year? Uh, so to John's point, you still have until Monday to make a tax deductible contribution to a retirement plan. Uh, so if you're, if you're in that, you're just into the 22% tax bracket, let's say you're $2,000 into the 22% tax bracket, you can put $2,000 in a traditional IRA before Monday and pull you back down out of that 22% tax bracket. And if you're over, is it 55 uh, or 50, I guess, is there a catch-up contribution you can tack onto that? Yeah, so the, uh, the total contribution for most people under age 50 is $6,500. If you're over age 50, it's $7,500. And that's true not only of, for a tax-deductible contribution, but for a Roth contribution also. And a minute left here, Ken, any final things you want to make sure people get uh, information-wise? Uh, just want to make sure that you don't forget to claim any credits that are available to you. I, I see credits missed all the time when I'm taking over an account. Uh, retirement plan contribution credits, foreign tax credits get missed a lot. Uh, foreign tax credits are if you're a U.S. citizen, you pay tax on your worldwide income to the federal government. But if you own any investments that are foreign, which most people do because they diversify, that foreign country takes taxes out of your dividend before you get it. So you don't have to pay taxes to two different countries. You can take a credit on your tax on your federal tax return for the taxes you paid the foreign country. Anything else? I think that'll do it for now. All right. Do you want to give your phone number out? Sure. It's 304-263-8981. Good to see you again, Ken. Good to see you. Send you out with your usual tax man tune here, the Beatles, the Can Apple, CPA. Uh, full disclosure, Ken does my taxes there.